Good afternoon, Mikio here, to talk to you about game design. First off, what is game design? Well, game design is kind of a umbrella term for the mechanics of a game and how they interact, balance and ideas, but it's a bit more than just, you know, coming up with ideas, it's developing them and seeing how and why they work. It's personally one of the things I love most about creating games. It's the game design, it's thinking up rules, it's one of the most crucial parts, it's what makes the whole thing sing, you know? And every game, uh, every game, whether board game, video game, whatever, it's got game design. It, some games do seem to have a bit less game design than others, and by that I mean it was kind of just stuff thrown out there. Or was copied from something else without really thinking of why they were copying it or what that would do to the end product. And I want to talk about game design in probably a couple of videos uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, I feel like sometimes developers, whether that be of board or video games, uh, kind of forget about some parts of game design and kind of just. They kind of just wing it like I get it, right? It seems a bit stupid to hire a guy to just tell you what to do, right? Like you're hiring some guy, he can't program, he can't do art for shit, he might be able to Photoshop some programmer art, but that's about it. Maybe he can do voice acting, but anybody can do voice acting technically. So what the fuck is he doing there? Is he just putting a thumb up his apps and telling you what to do? Well, in theory, no, he's the guy doing the playtesting, seeing if it's balancing, if it's fun. I mean, he's not the only one that knows what's fun, right? Fun is subjective. And you can just tell your programmers, just fucking play the game and tell you if it's good. If it's not, change it. But that doesn't always work that way. And sometimes you need somebody that might think from, you know, a bit, of more, a bit more of a macro scale. Or at least can analyze things a bit differently. You know, it's all about an analytical and creative mind kind of mixed together. Game design is a bit like that. And, yeah, it's a bit... You don't really want to buy... or You, you don't really want to buy the services of a game designer when you just got people already in your studio that can come up with ideas. In fact, if you started the game, if you started the project and you don't know what you're doing, then what the hell are you even here for, right? <laughs> like, once you got the idea, why would you need this guy? Well, because he can tell you things that might make the game more fun than it already is. Because here's the deal. Anybody can make a good game just based on what they think is good. But a game designer or somebody who can sort of think in a game design kind of way, which honestly is anyone, as long as you're mildly creative and even mildly, milder, even more mildly analytical. So by that I mean that a game designer should be able to take your base game, which is already quite fun, and be like, but what if, or what if we add this, or what if we change that? And suddenly you take an already good game and crank that shit up a few notches up and that's really what defines the cream from the crop how you distinguish yourself in the bloated industry right board games you can kind of uh, shimmy down the lackluster game design by piling on endless amounts of fucking miniatures so the D&D nerds can buy your stuff regardless and be like oh yeah I'm gonna use all that stuff and then they fucking do so, you know, they can use that. Video games just can pile on the sick-ass graphics or they can just stand there and be good simply by the sheer momentum of how big they are or how popular they are. Especially for multiplayer games because if you're trying to sort of shimmy yourself a place in the multiplayer game scene and you're not already a big IP yeah, you're gonna have issues because if there's not enough players, then not, no one will want to join in because there's not enough players to play the game, so you're just buying a fucking rock. 
and it's just the self perpetuating cycle of nothing happening. And it's the most sad thing in the entire fucking universe. But how do you avoid that death spiral? And I wanted to make this video to uh, sort of... I didn't make it for that, but it sort of inspired me to do this. And it's a virtual reality first person shooter called Contractors VR. It's a very good shooter. It's a very good shooter. And but it's a bit generic and by that I mean that like most shooters ever made in the last maybe 10-15 years it's sort of a boots on the ground military shooter can't aim and run at the same you know that kind of stuff and it's this game because I don't really play these kinds of uh, first person shooters because as I said they're a bit generic they're a bit well, not simplistic, they can be very tactical, but they lack a bit of charm. They lack a bit of, well, they lack game design. <laughs> That's why we're here. And yeah, most of these shooters do lack in game design. It's not just Contractors VR, it's just the one that, you know, brought it to my mind. And so I'll probably keep on referring to it. You know, I've played a bunch of similar games before this video, so I knew what I was talking about. And yeah, mostly fits, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less. So, the main example I want to give is, let's say you were to play a military shooter. Something that's relatively simulationist, but a bit cartoony. What weapon would you most see? And what weapon would be the best? Generally, that answer is either sniper rifles or assault weapons, or assault rifles. Just you now fully automatic, that kind of stuff. So sniper rifles are generally really good because the player is extremely skilled, precise, and the aiming is extremely quick, so you can just and then they die. Because most of these boots on the grounds game have extremely low TTK or time to kill. Which is how many shots or how long does it take for you to cap a motherfucker in the ass and have him die. And that's just mm, every game can have a different TTK, but most of the boosts at the ground go for a low TTK because it's realistic. And they also have assault weapons be one of the best because it's more realistic. There's a reason nobody is using a fucking M1 Garand in the army anymore because the more bullets you can shoot, the faster the other person will be dead. That's kind of how it's been for a good amount of years. Ever since World War II ended, Everybody's got, every army has assault weapons because, guess what? At long range, it's kind of capable if you go semi-automatic. It's not amazing, but you, you put a targeting reticle on there, re zero it, and I guess it's fine. Medium range, it can pretty much shoot anything. You just go to 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 for long enough and something's gonna die. At worst, you're just suppressing fire. At best, you just shot somebody in the face. And at short range, it just fucking shreds you. It just clears a freaking room. Never mind the shotgun. The shotgun just does the same thing but slower and to once. An assault weapon can clear room in the half the time a shotgun would take to do. Trenches were a bit of an exception because fully automatic weapons didn't shoot fast in the frickin' slightest and it was literally just corridor warfare. It was like the perfect moment for shotguns to be viable and nothing, nothing else. But the problem with that is that just because real life is like this doesn't mean your game should be like that now if you want to be like escape from Tarkov and be hyper realistic down to the most artistic degree then yeah obviously it makes sense to go that way but if you think about your game from a game design perspective from the fact that people will play it for fun that's when you realize that some things can be changed and that it could potentially make your game better Especially in games that are in virtual reality. Because in most of these games, you're not just shooting the weapon. You're not just using your mouse and clicking on heads. You're reloading the weapons yourself. You're aiming the weapons yourself. You're doing all this shit. And so it's a lot more difficult to actually shoot someone. But that means there's also a lot more possibility to make things more interesting and more unique by that I mean 
that you know assault most weapons are going to be relatively similar based on the action they have you know a fully automatic gun is going to be similar to others fully automatic guns the main difference is going to be that some full autos are going to be shoot faster or deal more damage because the caliber is bigger or whatever that's kind of the big difference like you can have like a gigantic ammo bag but it just go tung, 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 and at that point you could fire a pistol faster if you click fast enough so that's you know generally the variety you get with that then you get a full a couple semi-automatic weapons that are maybe a bit better at longer ranges some sniper rifles that are better at long ass ranges or just to if you're really precise with headshots some shotguns for short range and a knife that you're never going to use because why not and that's your lot and that's about where the gameplay ends most games either go for the CSGO approach or the loadout approach which is similar to what Call of Duty uses the CSGO approach is relatively simple games are made up in rounds and you buy weapons and when you get killed you lose those weapons you might be able to loot them from somebody who died or not generally that's kind of the idea sort of a risk and reward kind of thing you could go for the big massive super strong gun but if you die immediately you lost all that money you could use to buy you know a medium gun now and then a medium gun when you die right after personally I'm not a big fan of that but that's completely just my opinion the loadout method is where you prepare what weapons you want beforehand and then you go into the game and you're ready for that which is the method I prefer because it allows you to customize things a bit better but where that kind of sours the deal is that there's a lot of ways to do the loadout setup just like it is to do the CSGO method but maybe a bit less and I feel like they kind of forget that if you're going for a loadout weapon that means your main advantage is variety it's that you can make builds builds and you can sort of customize your setup kind of express what kind of gameplay you want into into this like the CSGO method is a lot more tactical it's more thinky like what do we need now in terms of teamwork the loadout method is a bit more for the cowboy in in all of us that just wanna fulfill a specific role that we want to play ourselves generally and you see that in also non-shooter games like um, Mordhau is a very good example of a very nice loadout system you know you got traits you got weapons you got a point system very good I really like it and the advantage of such a setup is that as I said you can really customize things to your likings but for that you need variety and that's when the reality kind of setup sort of creates a conflict you see as I said before fully automatic weapons in real life are pretty much the best it's kind of uncontestable you just can't really beat them it's kind of the meta game of real life as it were and that's also the case in these boots underground shooters even if they have a loadout setup but that also means that every weapon you include that isn't full auto is basically invalidated by the full auto weapons especially in VR where most every since they're based on real guns most every gun most every assault rifle can switch from full auto to semi auto which means they're even more polyvalent than they are in normal games and this means all of your other weapons that you took time to program and model and balance and all that shit completely got fucking thrown out the window you want to know why because if assault weapons do the job of each of these except maybe the sniper rifle strictly better so you made a system that encourages customization where the only choice you really have is what kind of assault rifle you want and for people that love assault rifles this is completely fine but not everybody does and I think those people that like assault rifles probably are, are only really gonna choose between two different assault rifles one that shoots fast and maybe one that does more damage and is a bit slower that's kind of the main paradigm of how you can make them different as I said in VR it's a bit more complex 
but still that's the main idea some people might gravitate to certain assault weapons because they like them in real life too but that's for an aesthetic reason not a mechanical one which is you know still completely fine but this is about game design so I'm gonna focus on the things that actually mechanically matter so then you might think well what's the issue so what if some weapons are invalidated well I think basing your entire game around fully automatic weapons also makes the gameplay relatively worse by that I mean that if you were to balance your game around I've seen this before uh, first-person shooters that focus less on fully automatic weapons and instead on purely semi-automatic weapons and sort of manual weapons as well for example um, Team Fortress 2 is a very good example in this game almost every weapon except the snipers SMG and the heavies minigun are semi-automatic oh yeah and the flamethrower as well though that's a bit of a different story every other weapon is relatively semi-automatic which means that the big focus of the game is instead on precision and while the TTK in that game is relatively lower than most military shooters it's still quite fast because all of these uh, semi-automatic shots deal a lot of damage if they can hit at the right distance and it makes for much more interesting firefights especially in terms of 1v1 because then you're kind of dancing around the enemy you're trying to juke them out and you're trying to fire and aim right at the same time while you need a lot less tracking skills if you're using a fully automatic weapon which is why they're good which is why they have some in that game they come with some pretty serious disadvantages the minigun has takes a while to spin and it's attached to the slowest character in the game the pyro's flamethrower has pitiful range against almost anything so you really need to ambush your opponents or catch them from the flank and the sniper's smg deals relatively low damage and doesn't have that good of a range but it's very useful for him because his main weapon is extremely slow and doesn't really do much if it in fact it does nothing if it's not scoped so he needs something he can really fall back on and that's where uh, fully automatic weapons do have their advantage they're extremely reliable and I feel like that's kind of the issue for most of these games they put all the focus on fully automatic weapons and putting a ton of them in there but they make them so much better than the rest that the game gets worse for it because the encounters are a lot less interesting you're almost always gonna get pelted at from mid to low distance and it's always gonna be just who shot the other guy first it's about movement well it's about placement and surprising your opponent that's where fully automatic gunfights end you're aiming at the guy if you aim it right and you start shooting first congratulations you fucking win sometimes you can headshot the guy big whoop and you manage to deal a bit more damage to him and you get the upper hand and that's about it some games try and spice things up by adding maybe a dodge roll with some invulnerability flames or other kind of things to kind of spice things up and add a bit of and that's kind of the issue when you're going for that cookie cutter plate that every other game has done without really thinking about the effects. Sure, most people that play, you know, Boots on the Ground, Call of Duty, all that kind of games, they're fine with that game gameplay. But you're severely kneecapping yourself if your name isn't Call of Duty or any other big franchise done by DICE or EA or whatever. Because your game is pretty much the exact same and even if you did quite a lot to differentiate it like it's in VR you can use different weapons it's got points it means nothing when everybody is basically using the same freaking gun and that same freaking gun is really easy to use you're basically putting the skill cap relatively low and inflating that skill cap by adding a really low time to kill 
because then it's about reflexes and knowing the maps and that's more or less where it ends and I think that's one of the best examples you could do so much more with a first person shooter and yet you're limiting yourself to that you've had a point system why not add some traits some different abilities uh, focus on semi-automatic weapons add a few weapons that you have to load every shot and make them good you know make them useful and then you can even be a bit more realistic because you know not every weapon is sort of encroaching on the because now every weapon is sort of encroaching on the turf of assault rifles like in most mm, boots underground shooters most people would tell you the shotguns are generally fucking terrible they can one shot someone at basically this range and that's about it after that they just disappear in the fucking mist when anybody that's shot a real shotgun knows that it can do a pretty good amount of range before the pellets start going every other which way so maybe since assault rifles are a bit less good in medium range or a bit less useful or there's just less choice you can make a shotgun with a bigger magazine that's got a pretty good long range keep like the short stock you know whatever super shotgun up XP for your criminally low ranges because yeah having a barrel this long ain't gonna help with the precision so yeah that's my main tip in terms of game design if you're doing a genre that's been tried and tested think about why the mechanics have been put in place and think of how they're gonna affect the gameplay how you learn it the difficulty curve small changes can have big effects and sometimes what you think is going to be a big change is really not going to do much to the main core gameplay loop and that's important to realize because then you can change and mold it to the way you want some games kind of go heavy on the game design by just piling on the game design and making a huge mechanic rich thing which can be a bit difficult to balance especially if it's a multiplayer focused game but can also be extremely fun cathartic and rewarding while some games just grind everything to its corest element to create a pure undiluted experience and that's fine too though it's perhaps a bit less replayable for the people sorry for the people that don't really get invested into this stuff easily you know the people that aren't really grinders hitting that grindstone to be the best of the best so it's a balancing act of course but it's really not that complicated at the end of the day you just need to ask yourself why are we doing this and if we're making our games based on a genre or another game entirely if you're wanting to rip off some other game ask yourselves why are the mechanics there what do they bring to the game how can we change them should we change them if we change them in what way do we change them what do we add after that do we just stop it there and call it a day it's very difficult but it's also really rewarding because the game becomes more unique it has its own reason to exist instead of being the dollar store version of something they already have you can't just rest on your laurels when it comes to game design you can't just be oh it's going to be in VR that's good enough you need to have a solid foundation underneath that if you if your foundation is freaking garbage wait a couple of years and your fucking house is going to be crooked and at that point if you change things too much you might as well call it a sequel and you kind of shot yourself in the foot And you know, I've been using video games as an example because that's the most easily seeable thing, but this applies to board games too. Like, but generally, board games is a bit more easier to do because you can't really, I mean, you can rip off a game, but at some point you have to make it different in certain ways. Or else it, it's really clear that you've made the same game, like you can't just use a different coat of paint and have it feel a bit different 
You, I mean, you can copy Monopoly for this kind of money grub and roll to move kind of whatever. But if you don't add anything, then everybody's going to see that it's Monopoly. So that effect is a bit mitigated on board games. You still need to think, like, if we're making a worker placement game or something like that, why are we doing worker placement? Or what can we take or learn from from other worker placement games? You know, I'm reminded of... Uh, I'm reminded of Richard Garfield that once said that a game designer should play games from all walks of life. He should play board games, all of the different board games, video games, you name it, uh, whatever other kind of games he could find, dice, card, board, whatever the hell you can find, and should always have an anatomical mind of what is this, how it works, why? What can I learn from that? And you can take inspiration from anything. You can take inspiration from video games to make your board game and vice versa. And it's worked extremely well before, like Armello. Of course, I mean, of course, sometimes it doesn't work and you end up having to use an app for your board game. That just makes everything clunky and that, you know, and people are going to be like, why the hell isn't this even a video game at that point? So, you know, that's also to be afraid of, but so I said, you can never, you can always find inspiration from different things. And that's also what's fun about game design. You're not just limited to one myopic thing that you have to learn. You can really expand your horizons, explore, experiment. It's like a mad science lab ready to be busted open. So please, please. For the love of all that is fun in this world, don't stop at the easiest or most tested thing that you can find. Don't just tweak things a little. Experiment. Go fucking hog wild. You'll be surprised what you can end up with. If you have a good... If you analyze what you're doing as you're doing it, and aren't just throwing shit at the wall for the sake of throwing shit at the wall. You might end up being a lot more surprised with the kind of reception your game is going to get. Because people are going to take a lot more attention to a game that distances itself from the crowd. Than to a game that does the same exact thing. That you have to be like, it's X, but there's abilities for MOBAs in it. You know, because that's the easy thing to do right now. And sure, adding different characters is a good way of adding content and stuff, but... Is adding three-lettered abilities really the most exciting thing you can come up with for your video game? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think you can do better. And yeah, that's it for now. Have a nice day.